Um, so this is the picture that, that uh, I will talk in more detail about in, in my um, uh, lecture and the workshop. And um, for now, I just want you to leave with the idea that obtaining this picture is the motivation for um, uh, almost everything else I'm going to say today. And then let me just give one more foreshadowing. So one day, um, I hope that, and I, actually I think this will be possible, um, certainly in my scientific lifetime, um, to study the interaction of all these objects coming from different regions of space. So this is just a cartoon. You might have like one shock singularity forming here. And here comes a shock hypersurface out of that shock singularity. And, and maybe it crashes into a Cauchy horizon that emanated from another first uh, classical singularity. And now you want to understand weak solutions in this region where the um, Cauchy horizon is interacting with a shock hypersurface. Um, so um, if you want to one day build up a global theory of solutions, um, you're going to have to understand all the different kinds of interactions that can take place. And so there's a lifetime of work ahead of anyone who's interested in the subject. <clears throat> okay. So I do want to talk about the new formulation a little bit. And let me just remind you things that you probably know very well by now. There are two geometric tensors in relativistic Euler flow um, that are of uh, crucial importance. Um, the first tensor is the four velocity. It's a vector field. And then you have the acoustical metric, um, which can be expressed in terms of the speed of sound, the Minkowski metric eta, and the four velocity, where uh, in this picture, um, the indices on U are being lowered and raised with the Minkowski metric. Okay. Um, and these tensors play an important ingredient in the new formulation. And as I mentioned, yes, sir. Uh, okay. You can compute that U, which is um, unit length with respect to, Mink, with, to, with respect to the Minkowski metric. It's also unit length with respect to the acoustical metric. So it's time-like, therefore it's transversal to all null hypersurfaces. And that, that's really important for, for, uh, for the theory. Okay, <clears throat> now it turns out that if you really wanna understand relativistic Euler from the wave point of view, it's very convenient to introduce uh, some auxiliary variables, some of which are standard and some of which are not. Um, so here it goes. Um, <clears throat> if someone gives you a vector field V, doesn't matter what it is, I wanna um, define something called the U orthogonal vorticity. And so here's the formula where epsilon is the usual anti-symmetric symbol normalized by epsilon zero, one, two, three is one. And I'm raising indices here with the Minkowski metric. Okay, so this is a definition. Uh, you can take the vorticity of any vector field V, but now I want to take the vorticity of a particular vector field, um, which is the product of the enthalpy H and the four velocity. Okay, so the vorticity vector field of this, and I wanna call this the, the fluid vorticity. Okay, this is, this is a, uh, tensor that you can read about in the relativistic fluids literature. Um, this is a well-known tensor. It's the correct relativistic analog of uh, vorticity um, from the point of view of, uh, for actually from many points of view, but certainly from regularity uh, theory point of view. And then it's convenient to introduce a one form big S, which is the gradient uh, of the entropy scalar little s. Okay, so those are kind of uh, standard uh, quantities to introduce. Um, uh, however, the quantities I'm gonna put on this slide are far from standard. Uh, we call them modified, modified fluid variables. Um, what's so good about them? Um, they exhibit improved regularity. So they, have, <laughs> they basically are one degree more differentiable than you might expect. And uh, they solve PDEs which are consequences of relativistic Euler um, that have a good quasi-linear null structure. And I really mean null structure with respect to the acoustical metric. So um, there's no Taylor expansions in, in the nonlinear terms being done. This is really the full nonlinear structure, all orders that is being, um, has good properties. So here they are, <clears throat> C and D, they're a mess. 
um, the principal parts the main the main part is the on for each uh, term is found is it's the very first term. So C alpha up to lower order errors that end up being important um, is the vorticity of omega, where omega is already the vorticity. So this is, you know, remember omega is the vorticity h times u, and uh, c is the vorticity of omega. So if you want, this is a double curl. So it's, it's like, and remember, big S is uh, the divergence. Uh, or sorry, the gradient of little s. So this is a divergence of a gradient, so a second derivative of little s. Okay, and from the point of view of regular, these are principal terms. These lower order terms have been added on by hand on purpose to cancel other terms in the equations so that he uh, with uh, every miracle that you could hope for. Now, what is theta? Theta is the temperature variable that I introduced um, early on in the lectures. Um, for purposes of this part of the talk, you should think that temperature is a nonlinear function of little h and s, where little h is basically the log of big H, logarithmic enthalpy. And the number density is also viewed as a function of h and s. Okay, and both of these functions, theta and n, are determined by the equation of state, and the details don't matter. And then, uh, just a notation, this sem theta semicolon h means the derivative of temperature with respect to logarithmic enthalpy at fixed entropy. Okay, so that sort of shows you how everything is defined. Um, now, what are these null forms relative to G? Now I can, I can say what all of them are. There are only two kinds. Uh, the second kind are the most famous two. Those are the kinds that are anti-symmetric with respect to alpha and beta. They act on scalar functions. And then there's the kind that really depends on the metric. That's why I call them null forms relative to G. And uh, it's this. And uh, um, both of these null forms appear in the new formulation. Of good structure. From the point of view of PDE analysis, um, there are no Riccati terms. There's no L psi squared. So sorry, there's no L phi times L phi tilde term um, in either of these expressions if you expand relative to a uh, fluid null frame. Okay, and, and that's at the end of the day, that's why you can treat these semi linear terms as lower order terms because they're not of Riccati type. Okay. So what is the purpose of writing down this new formulation? Um, well, uh, we want to use geometric techniques from mathematical general relativity and nonlinear wave equations. Um, uh, the big new issue compared to the case of pure uh, wave equations or pure gravity, if you want, are that you have the interaction of wave and transport phenomena. So this is difficult from the point of view of regularity and decay. So decay, if you're just get if you're studying solution regimes where there's some kind of dispersive behavior. So the transport phenomena are from plasticity and the entropy, and they're interacting with the sound waves. Um, so and one way to say that is you have a problem with multiple characteristic speeds. And this is already just in the fluid problem itself. If you couple to Einstein, you have a second wave speed, which is faster. Um, okay, so here is the um, a schematic depiction of the formulation of relativistic Euler flow that I derived with Marcello Descanzi. And the full details, um, you can, our paper is on the archive. Um, it's basically the same as the published version. So you can find the precise expressions. Um, if you actually write out the details, they're very complicated. We had to write out the details when we were um, uh, writing this paper because we needed to find a whole bunch of cancellations. Okay, so if you look at the last third of the paper, it's basically a bunch of care careful calculations, um, which again, you need to do those calculations to uh, make sure there are those cancellations. But once you have them, the details, you know, typically don't really matter. What really matters, on the right-hand side of the wave equation for psi, you have null forms, and uh, terms that are equal to the, 
you know, constructed out of those special modified fluid variable C and D from the other slide. So, you know, C and D are exactly these things. These are these special variables. So um, that's what you have. So more precisely, if you take any element of the solution um, set, so that means H or a Minkowski component of the four velocity or the entropy scalar, let me just call that psi. Any such, any such psi satisfies a geometric wave equation, box psi, where the acoustical metric G depends on everything, you know, depends on all of these variables. And these size satisfy wave equations where the right-hand side looks like this. Uh, on the one hand, you can have null forms, which really are not important for shock waves. On the other hand, you have these variables C and D, which uh, will lose one derivative if you're not careful. Then you have two transport equations. You have a transport equation for the vorticity. So that's given here and schematic. On the right-hand side, you have one derivative of psi. And then you have a wave equation, sorry, a transport equation for the um, gradient of little s, which is called big S. And uh, here's what it looks like schematically. Okay, now uh, formally, remember what is C? C is like a double curl. So it's like curl of a curl. Curl of a curl of what? Well, basically uh, U. So it's like the curl of a curl of U. And U, is one of the elements of psi. So if you just count derivatives, it's like two derivatives of psi. So if you just count derivatives, this wave equation says two derivatives of psi on the left equals two derivatives of psi on the right. And usually that's forbidden. If, if you're just thinking about psi and not treating C and D separately, you will never prove any useful well posedness result by putting second derivatives on the right-hand side. You simply can't do that. That's a lot of derivative. Um, <clears throat> but as it turns out, uh, these terms are actually better, okay? Um, in fact, uh, generic derivatives of omega, so generic derivatives of the vorticity and capital S are better, okay? You can show that as a consequence of relativistic Euler, um, all of these variables uh, satisfy additional equations, okay? So you have a space-time divergence of omega is equal to some stuff on the right-hand side. You have a transport equation for the um, special variable C that equals some stuff, and the stuff is all null forms or uh, multiples of C or D. There's nothing else. And similarly, the variable D satisfies a transport equation, uh, again, in the U direction, where on the right-hand side, you get null forms, null forms. And the vorticity of, um, of, uh, of big S is zero. Okay. Um, okay, so again, all of these equations are derivable as a consequence of the relativistic Euler equations. So in other words, if you have a sufficiently smooth solution to relativistic Euler, um, C2 or C3 would be enough. I'd have to count carefully. If you have it, then if you assume you have a smooth solution and you differentiate the equations in inspired directions, and just if you want, do the algebra, you conclude that this system of equations also holds. Now, if you actually look at this paper with this Kanzi and you look at those calculations, you would think it's crazy. You know, why would you look for this? Why should this exist? <clears throat> um, uh, I only have two answers for that, and none of them are fully satisfying. Why, does, why is this possible? Why does this exist? First answer is that um, we were hopeful because I did this with Jonathan Luke in the non-relativistic setting where everything worked out. And so we just had some, you know, just a little bit of uh, faith, I guess, that something similar could hold in the relativistic setting. Um, second answer is something I said before. Ultimately, um, this system of PDEs derives from a Lagrangian. And even though I didn't write down that Lagrangian or implement that setup in these lectures, you can read about it in Christodoulou's action principle book. So once you have a PDE that derives from a Lagrangian, you sort of know that there are gonna be um, coming from the um, diffeomorphism invariance of the Lagrangian, you know there are gonna be some limitations placed on the kinds of terms that can in principle be involved in writing down the equations 
So just because they're a covariant system from that, from that alone, you sort of know that you know, not all possible combinations of terms are going to be allowed. And so that's why you can have some hope um, based on those principles that something good like this should happen. But at the end of the day, if somebody else had a better way of deriving this, a more convincing way, um, you, know, you know, sort of explaining why it should be, I, I would personally be very happy to see that. So anyway, this is the system. Um, let me just say something about regularity theory. Um, the good thing about this uh, setup is that it allows you to prove that it is possible to have a regularity theory for smooth solutions. Okay, smooth up until the time of shock formation, that is, so that the vorticity omega has the same regularity as psi. And similarly for uh, uh, sim similarly for s, so that's like if you assume that the vorticity and entropy gradient variable are one degree more differentiable than you might expect they are. If you, if you put that assumption into the initial data, then this system of PDEs will allow you to propagate that. Okay, just to be um, explicit, um, <clears throat> let's say that you want to control at the level of h1. So that's like doing an energy estimate for this equation. To do that, you have to prove that the variables C and D are in L2. That's how you uh, H1 regularity. For a wave equation solution, you prove that the right-hand side is in L2. So how do you prove that the uh, right-hand side is in L2? Um, so you look at this transport equation for, for uh, C. Transport equations do not gain regularity. So the only way to do that is if the right-hand side is an L2, all right? And having D psi in L2 is consistent because you're trying to prove size in H1, so that's good. So how do you prove that D omega is in also in L2? So that's like saying omega and psi have to have the same differentiable. Again, you can put that assumption into the initial data, but how do you propagate that? Well, uh, everything you need to know is basically in the box because uh, on the one, this, this uh, first equation is a, a divergence equation. So this says divergence of omega is uh, up to lower order terms equal to d psi. And this basically is the transport equation for the curl of omega. <laughs> so this is a di divergence equation. This is a curl equation. So it's a div curl system. So this basically says that the, you have a div curl system for omega, <laughs> which is where the right-hand side has a consistent amount of regularity. Namely, it's an L2. So if you prove that divergence of omega is in L2 and curl is in L2, then you can basically use Hodge theory to prove that d omega is in L2, similarly for ds. Now, the real complex work, okay, one of the complications that comes up is that in reality, you need, um, you need to do something like uh, spatial divergence, whereas this is a space-time divergence. And you know this curl operator is like a four-dimensional curl, but you need to extract three-dimensional regularity on uh, hypersurfaces, and that can be done. And the way you do it is you split, um, uh, you know, derivatives, the space-time derivatives, up into a part that's parallel to you, and a part that is, um, uh, let's say, tangent to sigma t. If you want, you can always do that kind of decomposition. The part that's parallel to you is in the direction of the um, propagation, sorry, uh, yeah, it's in the direction of the propagation operator for omega. So in other words, u derivatives, u derivatives of omega are on, automatically good, <laughs> consistent with the regularity assumptions by the transport equation. So you can extract the part of this expression that is, depends on the u derivatives of omega and you can put it on the right. And then the remaining part is something like a spatial divergence of omega, okay? And uh, that can be made precise and so on and so forth. Um, so the short version of the story is that even though this is like a space-time div curl system, from it, one can in fact extract spatial div curl systems that give you exactly the regularity that you need, a consistent derivative counting that I did for you earlier. Okay, so basically from the point of view of regularity, you can prove uh, well posedness for relativistic Euler for initial data such that um, uh, omega and big S are exactly as regular as psi. So that's a gain of uh, one derivative for those variables. And 
you have all of these good null structures present on the right hand side, these null form structures, which are important when you want to study shock waves. And also when you want to differentiate the equations and do estimates for higher derivatives, um, the commutator vector fields that one constructs in the context of shock waves, um, it so happens that they interact very well with these null forms. That's not surprising to anyone who's ever studied null forms for Einstein equations. They typically interact well under uh, differentiation with good vector fields. And that's usually part of the calculus that one has to implement um, when studying Einstein equations uh, uh, with respect to, say, characteristic coordinates. Okay, so uh, this is basically all of these structures together, their, their totality is what allow you at the end of the day to treat relativistic Euler as if it were a perturbation of a wave equation. If you're interested in the shock wave part of the solution, all of the action is found on the, on the left-hand side of this very first equation. And everything else you prove is uh, uh, an error term. Okay, so we're gonna work to handle all these error terms, as you might imagine, especially with the added complication that you have to do div curl systems where there's a transport aspect of it. Um, but nonetheless, that is the driving philosophy behind how we think about shock waves. And that's why the model problem box psi equals zero um, is a good model problem from the point of view of understanding the structure of the maximal development. Um, um, so like I said, the, the, these structures found in relativistic Euler flow are you know, qualitatively the same as the ones in non-relativistic Euler flow. And so that formulation of relativistic flow opens up the door for lots of applications, some of which have been achieved. I've mentioned some of these earlier. Um, even though it hasn't been done, I have uh, every confidence that one can prove stable shock formation for relativistic Euler. Um, like, like in my work with Luke, you don't need symmetry and you definitely need good null structure to make progress on shock wave problems. Um, I have a PhD student, Sifan Wu, who's work on, working on a low regularity result for um, relativistic Euler. Um, that's a relativistic analog of the work that I mentioned earlier in the non-relativistic case, um, where you don't need structure because um, basically for short time existence problems, Riccati terms are not problematic. You know, the Riccati term may drive a singularity, but for small, day, for small time local existence, you don't really care if there's a Riccati term. Um, if you want to understand how to extend the solution past the shock as a weak solution uniquely, in other words, if you want to solve the shock development problem, certainly you need the null structure. And um, this is what Chris Sedulu did in the relativistic case with uh, under the irrotational assumption. So this is the restricted shock development problem where he ignored vorticity and entropy. Um, and for that problem, the null structure is crucial. And um, ultimately, so this is something I mentioned earlier, but I want to harp on it again. Really, I hope that one day we can understand long time dynamics of solutions that have shocks where they're allowed to interact. Okay, the large data problem, there's no doubt it's out of reach, every bit as hard as the large data Einstein problem. But maybe there are perturbative regimes where it, you know, we can get our hands on it, like near spherical symmetry, near zero vorticity, near plane symmetry. These are all very promising regimes to explore. And um, I, I think in my lifetime, you're gonna see some real um, fantastic developments in those regimes. Okay, but even though I'm hopeful for the future, away from symmetry, these problems are all open. Okay, the long time dynamics with shocks. Um, however you think about it, I have no doubt that the null structure will be crucial for uh, understanding solutions. Okay. All of these applications, all of these ideas, they uh, rely on nonlinear geometric optics. Um, and a key point tied to the new formulation of, of relativistic Euler flow that I put on this other slide is that it allows for a sharp implementation of nonlinear geometric optics. And you do this in the same way that you do for Einstein equations. This is with an acoustic iconal function. So this is the iconal equation. Away from plane symmetry, you cannot just solve a transport equation for you, you have to solve this fully nonlinear hyperbolic equation 
where the principal coefficients depend on the fluid. So this is the acoustical metric. And this DTU, this is just a convention. You know, this is basically telling you which square root to take in this equation. If you want to study perturbations of uh, plane symmetric solutions, um, it turns out that you have a lot of freedom in choosing your initial conditions for the iconal function. And you can just as well pick the initial data at time zero to be exactly what it is in plane symmetry. For other problems, like low regularity problems, the choice of an initial condition for the iconal function becomes really important. And uh, from, from regularity considerations, you can't just pick it to be something like this. You actually have to pick it to be something much bit. And sometimes you even have to construct the initial data and so forth. That's a long story that I'm not really gonna focus on. But for shock waves, it, it, the, the initial conditions for the iconal function are, seem to be not that important. You just have to be kind of uh, not too far away from what you're trying to prove, which is that the characteristics are perturbations of um, the ones in plane symmetry. This is like a fully nonlinear hyperbolic PDE. It, it's been well studied, especially starting with Chris Adulu Kleinerman from uh, their Stability of Minkowski Space Time book. A lot of the same ideas that are used in that book in the context of gravity apply in the context of fluids. Um, you'll see in the coming slides, I'm gonna call the level sets of U. These are, are null hypersurfaces. I'm gonna call them P indexed by the value of U. They play a critical role in all of these results, local and global results for wave equations um, also require, uh, there are many results that require um, these null hypersurfaces. And at the end of the day, the regularity theory of iconal equations is difficult, very difficult. It's very tensorial, directionally dependent, and it's influenced by the Euler solution, by the fluid solution. And the vorticity and entropy have a very interesting influence on the regularity of, of the iconal function. Um, uh, that's a, a very long and technical story, but let me just say, say succinctly that, um, uh, you get very lucky. <laughs> you get. Let me go back to the formulation. Lucky that on the right-hand side of this wave equation, you have C and D. So C is like a uh, um, first derivative. C is the curl of omega. It's the curl of the vorticity. So curl of omega. You get very lucky that you C, which satisfies this good transport equation, and not some generic first derivative of omega. If you had some generic first derivative of omega, or some first derivative of S instead of C and D exactly, then there would be real problems uh, with the theory. A lot, of this, a lot of these things I'm saying would not work out, uh, but it's not easy for me to say at a qualitative level why that's the case that ends up um, getting into very difficult questions about the top order regularity theory of different tensors. So I'm not gonna discuss it in deta detail. I just want you to be aware of how sensitive a lot of are to the precise details of the new formulation. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what is the acoustical metric? Um, it turns out that for these um, uh, kinds of applications, it's the overall conformal scaling of the acoustical metric doesn't matter. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's not that important. It's very convenient to rescale the acoustical metric so that its, uh, it's inverse zero, zero component is uh, minus one. You can always do this by dividing out the metric by a scalar function that depends on the fluid. This, it slightly changes the covariant wave operator. It gives you an additional semi-linear term compared to the old covariant wave operator, but it's a null form. <laughs> then, you know, the new, the new term that you get out of doing this basically is one of those G null forms and it, that's really harmless. So it doesn't really matter that you can formally rescale the metric. But it's just convenient. A lot of the formulas and uh, pictures depend on this particular renormalization, but at the end of the day, it's just a convenient choice. Okay, so now that you have your iconal function U, how do you construct geometric coordinates? Um, truth be told, it depends on the topology of the, of the uh, initial data hypersurface that you're choosing to deal with. Um, if you are studying um, perturbations of plane symmetric solutions, um, in the Minkowski space time, R times R3, or maybe you do what I was doing earlier. Instead of R3, you take R cross T2, where the T2 directions break the plane symmetry. 
Um, <clears throat> let's put these coordinates on uh, Minkowski space-time and let's call their corresponding partial derivatives dt, d1, d2, d3. So these are like, uh, let's call them rectangular partial derivatives. And then the geometric coordinates um, for perturbations of plane symmetry, um, you can use x2 and x3 as coordinates and you can use t as a coordinate as well and you can get away with changing x1. So instead of x1, you replace it with u and uh, let's call this geometric and then let's call this you know, ddt, ddu, ddx2, ddx3, the corresponding partial derivatives. Okay, so basically this is how you implement, implement geometric coordinates um, away from plane symmetry <clears throat> for perturbations of plane symmetry. Um, it's not that hard. And let me also say that a way, um, something, if you want to study, let's say, perturbations of spherically symmetric solutions, or you want to study um, small data solutions, um, you, can, um, uh, you can do something similar. You can take the Minkowski, let's say, the standard spherical coordinates and spherical partial derivatives, and you can replace uh, exactly one of the coordinates. You can replace the radial coordinate, the flat radial R with a corresponding iconal function coordinate U, and you can do something similar in that setting. So you could use T, U, and then two Minkowski angular coordinates in that setting, and that would give a good geometric coordinate system for studying uh, perturbations of spherically symmetric solutions or small data solutions. Okay, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you can implement this. Um, once you have U, um, that's really a, that you have almost everything you need, and the theory seems to be a lot less sensitive to the other coordinates that you impose. Okay, what about the inverse foliation density away from symmetry? So in symmetry, um, it was like one, there was minus one divided by the d1 derivative of the iconal function here. This formula is a little different. It actually doesn't quite agree with the old formula in plane symmetry, but the difference is like an order one constant, um, an order one factor, I should say. But this is the, uh, a good definition of mu away from plane symmetry and uh, sort of an easy computation based on your um, initial condition for the iconal function and the precise form of the acoustical metric, which I wrote earlier in the lectures, but I'm not writing again. You can show that for regular data at time zero, mu is approximately one. And this, this is just a way of saying that initially, you know, the, the characteristic hypersurfaces are approximately uniformly separated and you're not close to forming a shock. Okay. So basically you have nice initial conditions. How do you construct null vector fields that play the role of L in the L bar away from symmetry? Well, you certainly don't have explicit formulas anymore, but uh, you can basically follow strategy from the stability of Minkowski space, the Christodoulou Kleinerman version. You can introduce the gradient vector field of the iconal function. You can raise an index with the acoustical metric, put a minus sign to get it future directed. And this will be a future pointing geodesic vector field. So this will be null by virtue of the iconal equation. And if you rescale it by the null lapse, if you multiply by mu, <clears throat> um, you get a very nice vector field, which is still null, but it's now has a good normalization so that if you apply it to the, um, uh, to the rectangular T function, you get exactly one. The um, L derivative of T is exactly one. And this, this L as defined is in fact exactly the same in plane symmetry as the L um, that I defined earlier explicitly in terms of the Riemann invariance. Okay, so this is the same L in plane symmetry, but away from plane symmetry, you don't have an explicit formula. You have to construct the iconal function U and control it. Okay, so this is how you construct L. Now, what about the vector fields you need away from plane symmetry to understand the flow? Um, well, you wanna construct something like a null frame. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly a null frame for the purpose of studying shock waves. In fact, there are advantages to using not a null frame, but a related frame, which I'm simply calling an adapted frame here, um, which has uh, two kinds of vector fields. It's got vector fields that are tangent to the characteristics. So that's going to be L, Y2, and Y3. 
and it's got one vector field that's transversal, which is called X. So X is kind of like L bar, but instead of being, um, uh, the, the main difference between L bar and X is that X is tangent to constant time slices. Very convenient for various kinds of analysis one needs to do. It's not essential. The whole theory would have worked just as well if we used L bar instead of X. So what is X? So X by definition, it's sigma T tangent. So T is the usual rectangular T, T uh, coordinate. It points to the left, it's unit length by the acoustical metric and it's orthogonal with, by the acoustical metric. With respect to these, these are, uh, uh, let's say topological tori. Um, if your um, space part of your system is R times T2, these will be uh, diffeomorphic to T2. This is the intersection of constant time slices with your null hypersurfaces. So in the stability of Minkowski space-time book, these would be your spheres, but I'm looking at a different topology where these are either lines or two-dimensional thori. <clears throat> um, and then there's this important rescaling of the transversal direction X that's done. You put a mu in front of it. So that, remember this mu goes to zero when the shock forms. And so this is a way of rescaling the transversal direction in exactly the right way. Okay, so that, that's the transversal vector field. Now, what about these YAs? Um, you basically take your uh, rectangular DAs, um, you know, flat, uh, you know, coming from the ambient flat spacetime, and you orthogonally project them onto the topological tori. And this will give you, uh, this projection gives you vectors that are tangent to the tori, and the tori live inside the null hype. So these YA are tangent to the characteristics. And you have um, uh, two of them, one for A equals two and one for A equals three. Okay, so you put them all together into a set that's called an adapted frame. And if you use the rescaled transversal direction, this brev X instead of the regular X, that's called a rescaled frame. And the whole theme of the analysis away from plane symmetry is to derive regular estimates for the solution with respect to the rescaled frame. So in other words, you differentiate everything lots of times with respect to the rescaled frame vector fields and show that everything remains bounded. <laughs> and secretly, again, what you're doing is you're putting a factor of mu in front of the transversal direction. So if you have a weighted, this brev x, if the weighted x derivative of something is, so mu times x of something is bounded, um, that doesn't mean that the x derivative of that thing is small. It's the mu times x derivative of that thing is small. So remember, mu is going to zero. So basically, you know, this is how you hide the singularity. Everywhere you see something that wants to blow it up, you smash it down by putting a mu in front of it. And, you know, when mu goes to zero, that's the product from blowing up. That's exactly how the analysis works. Um, <clears throat> it's not hard to show that this is equivalent to showing that the solution remains smooth in directions tangent characteristics. Um, equivalently, as it turns out, it, um, it's smooth with respect to the T, U, X2, X3 differential structure. Sorry, this should have been a capital U. This should have been the uh, iconal function U. So uh, the short version of the story is this is just the way of implementing the idea that in characteristic coordinates, the solution should remain pretty smooth. You should not see the singularity. Okay, so here's a picture. Uh, obviously I can't call four space-time dimensions, so I'm suppressing one of the dimensions and instead of y2 and y3, I'm just calling the symmetry breaking direction y. At, at time zero, you have these approximately equidistant characteristic surfaces. And then as the evolution progresses and the characteristics can start to bunch up as the shock starts to form. And this picture shows you what's going on with the vector field frame. You have these null generators L, you have these other tangential directions y that break the symmetry. Uh, break the plane symmetry. And then um, X is basically order one vector field, but if you put a mu in front of it, uh, it goes, mu times X goes to zero as the shock starts to form. So you can see that this transversal direction is getting very short. Okay, so you're exactly putting the right factor in front of the transversal direction to compensate for the singular behavior of the fluid when you differentiate it in the transversal direction. So that's like the flavor of the analysis. And you know, as you might imagine, when you go to go to do PDE estimates, you're carrying mu weights with you everywhere, and um, it, it's very important to understand 
these weights, mu, and not only that, but the behavior of their derivatives with respect to time and with respect to space. So basically the fact that mu is shrinking, you know, it's, here it's one and here it's going to zero. It's shrinking basically because the derivative is, has a sign is negative that is connected to the blue shift effect in relativity. And the fact that the L derivative of mu is negative plays a fundamental role in the PDE analysis. It gives you a friction term in the energy estimates and the precise analysis around that is very delicate. And I certainly uh, go into that today. Just want you to be aware of these things, that there is some monotonicity in the problem that helps you uh, do PDE estimates. And the monotonicity is nothing other than the fact that the characteristics are together. In, means they're shrinking in the L directions and that's like having a negative L derivative. Okay. So it's interesting that the same thing that's causing the singularity, um, namely the shrinking of mu, is actually giving you monotonicity in the PDE and L that serves as your friend when, when you're trying to close estimates. So mu going to zero on the one hand, it's like your enemy because it wants to create a blow up. On the other hand, there's monotonicity in the PDE uh, energy identities. Okay. Um, so what about the method of Riemann invariance? Okay, away from plane symmetry, they're certainly no longer invariant, but they are approximately invariant. So you can define uh, these Riemann that are functions of the enthalpy S in U1, and you get it just like in plane symmetry in the isentropic case by solving this uh, ODE or this transport equation with the same initial conditions as in plane symmetry. Um, the difference here is S is no longer has to be zero. It can be uh, uh, positive. And therefore, as it turns out, um, R plus and R minus are no longer invariant in the sense that, um, uh, you know, they're, if you differentiate them in the L direction, you will not get zero. You will get error terms all over the place. One of the error terms will be coming from when derivatives fall on S. But Near isentropic plane symmetry, that will be a small error term and um, very easy to handle. And so the story is that you can uh, use these almost Riemann invariants to study the flow and much an analogy with the way that you use actual Riemann invariants in the context of plane symmetric solutions. Okay, so this is what enables you to study perturbations of simple waves. You can take initial data so that, you know, R plus is big, R minus is small, but not zero anymore, and alpha breaking, so on and so forth. And uh, you can study the problem perturbatively. Okay, perturbations of simple waves. So perturbatively means um, you you can um, uh, you can set up the problem so that your unknowns are R plus and R minus, U two, U three, and the entropy. So in the simple plane wave setting, there was only R plus. <laughs> simple plane waves exactly correspond to solutions where r minus is zero, u2 is zero, u3 is zero, and s is zero. More generally, you can actually use these as unknowns in the fluid equation and formulate the Euler exactly in terms of these fluid variables, which I'm now calling psi. Uh, uh, that's a recycling of the notation from the theorem. That's uh, psi had a slightly different meaning instead of Riemann invariance. There was like a one. Um, but so it is a recycling of the notation, but it's really not that important because these psi, they also solve covariant wave equations with the same qualitative character as in the new formulation. So basically these R and R minuses, they also solve wave equations of the same qualitative character as, as the logarithmic enthalpy and, and U1. And you can basically do exactly the same thing um, as in the new formulation. It looks qualitatively identical. And <clears throat> I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again. So this is for perturbations of uh, plane waves. You can do the same thing for perturbations of uh, isentropic, simple, spherically symmetric waves. So there is a big difference between plane symmetric and spherically symmetric. If you want the differences powers of R, in spherical symmetry, you have powers of R. And a related fact is that dispersive effects become important. So in these, Approximately plane symmetric problems, you don't have dispersion, you don't have powers of T floating around, you don't have to worry about decay, you can just worry about the singularity. But for small data problems, uh, where you have like finite energy, as opposed to plane symmetric solutions where, you're, where 
at least uh, if the space topology is R3, a plain symmetric solution would have infinite energy. Um, <clears throat> um, and so near spherical symmetry, you have dispersion and decay. So there's competing effects, tendency of dispersive, uh, of wave dispersion. And then there's also the shock formation tendencies. And those two things sort of compete with each other. And so if you study perturbations of spherically symmetric solutions, you have to deal with both effects at the same time. The decay caused by this dispersion, fighting against the tendency of waves to focus from uh, shock effects. Okay. Okay, so how do you see that a shock forms away from symmetry? Well, write down the evolution equation for mu. So remember L is like DDT and um, you can compute. So you have all these uh, difficult geometric computations that you have to do away from plane symmetry, but nonetheless, here's what you get. You get that the L derivative of mu, so remember this is kind of like DDT, has a main part, which is like the uh, weighted X derivative of R plus. This is just like in plane symmetry, plus now you have an error term. And the error term depends on all this other stuff. It depends on all the symmetry breaking variables, as well as the L derivative, L derivatives of everything, and some terms come with a factor of mu. Actually, everything has a factor of mu. It's just this notation weighted x really high. It's the factor of mu in the definition of weighted x. This is like by definition mu times unweighted x. And now the expressions depend not only on the fluid, but also on your null frame. So in particular on the um, Minkowski rectangular components of your vector field L. So that's sort of Thing in this equation. It's a long story, but it can be done by a bootstrap. The important point is that for all equations of state except the special one, this f is not zero. This is a statement of genuine nonlinearity. You know, so this term is always there if you want. So how do you make mu go to zero? Well, here's what you do. Um, first of all, you choose initial conditions so that error is small. So this error will be small if you're near plane, near simple plane sym symmetry. In simple isentropic plane theory symmetry, all of these terms are zero, error is zero. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, you can hope to propagate, uh, if you choose initial data where error is small at time zero, you can hope to propagate that. In fact, you can. And you also choose initial conditions where this dominant term on the right-hand side of the mu equation is approximately minus one, at least in a, uh, you know, thick uh, interval of values. Um, <clears throat> so if it is, you know, minus one for a long enough time, and mu starts off near one, then of course mu will go to zero in finite time. It starts off near one and it has negative uh, L derivative. That's what makes mu goes to zero. You can also prove you could, that this main term, uh, this X weighted X derivative of R plus, which um, again is mu times the unweighted derivative of R plus is order one for all time up to the singularity. And so that tells you that if you solve for the XR plus, so you have to divide out by mu, um, XR plus blows up like one over mu. So if you just divide by mu, you see that XR plus blows up like one over mu. And this exhibits a singularity with respect to the T X1, X2, X3 differential structure um, because the unweighted X derivative of R plus is basically like an order, like a Euclidean length derivative of R plus, and you can see that because the X1 component, sorry, the, um, the cart if you want, the, the one component of the unweighted vector field X can be shown to be order of magnitude one for all time. So this is how you see the singularity. Um, now, what about <clears throat> all of these other estimates that you have to do away from uh, when you're away from symmetry? So uh, you have a whole bunch of transport equations that you have to estimate. So you can write down transport equations for the components of Li and the vector field Xi. So these are all consequences of the iconal equation. So you can drive these equations. They come directly from differentiating the iconal equation. You have the transport equations coming from the compressible Euler flow. And uh, you can prove that both of these right-hand sides are small error terms. Um, when the initial conditions are near simple isentropic uh, plane symmetric initial data. Now what about the psi equation? So this psi equation, this is actually secretly the wave equation. So what I've done is I've taken the, the wave operator box and I've split it up into, into two parts. There's like a transport part derivative of a transversal derivative. 
And on the right-hand side, there's only uh, tangential derivatives, tan tangent to the character of psi, and error terms. So you can do this at the lower derivative levels, but uh, but this represents angularity. You know, you're losing derivatives by doing this. You're basically putting the angular Laplacian on the right-hand side and treating it like an error term. That's fine, below top order. You can do this. And um, from this perspective, you can basically treat the problem like it's a transport problem. You know, everything you want to do, everything is transported. You prove that the problem is a perturbation of um, the plane symmetric problem just by treating everything like a transport equation. And the hard part is you can't really close the problem like this, of course. At the end of the day, there is a top order estimate that has to be done, and that's the energy estimates. And uh, I can see I'm, I'm basically out of time. So I am not going to talk to you about all of the complicated things that you have to do for the energy estimates. Let me just show you that you end up doing energy estimates on regions that look like this, combinations of null hypersurfaces and uh, flat uh, sigma t slices. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I won't go into those details, it's very technical. I just wanna say that it has some mathematical commonalities with the kinds of techniques that have been employed in the study of Big Bang formation. And um, you know, the punchline is, by this, by following these techniques, you can follow the solution up until the very first time of singularity formation. This approach gives you, um, it enables you to understand the solution at the time of first blow up without symmetry assumptions, but it doesn't quite give you that beautiful, nice picture that I showed you at the beginning of the talk where you have the boundary of the maximal development and the Cauchy horizon. To get that full picture, you need quite a few other additional techniques that I'll talk about. Uh, next week in the workshop. And so with my last minute, let me just um, jump ahead to the future a little bit. Uh, I will give you some things to think about. I've said this a couple of times, but I'll say it again. To what extent does this carry over to Einstein Euler? I don't know. It's a great series of problems. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for progress, but uh, again, uh, the truth is I don't know what to expect at this point. To solve the shock development problem, um, locally solving past the shock singularity. That's something I think Chris Adulu is working on. Um, but once that's achieved, um, it will open up the door to studying the long time behavior of the solution, uh, weak solution. And that's a great open problem, um, especially when you have shocks and they're interacting with each other. So before you can really solve that problem, you need all the little pieces, like how the different individual kinds of components interact with each other. Um, and each of those components themselves are great open problems. Um, one of the big things you'll have to do if you really want to understand truly long time behavior is come to terms with what happens to the vorticity. Um, even in the incompressible case, that's a hard problem. But at least in some perturbative regimes, it's possible to understand, uh, hopefully, um, uh, what happens to the vorticity. And finally, uh, Einstein Euler is interesting, but so are many other multiple speed systems. Um, elasticity, crystal optics, nonlinear electromagnetism. All of these systems take the following form where you no longer have Lorentzian geometry. You have these more complicated tensors that have four indices. And so already you're way outside of the realm of Lorentzian geometry and into this uh, new realm of hyperbolic PDEs where the principal part is much more complicated and, and possibly much more coupled. And to even get started on these problems, you'd have to de develop like a new geometry uh, adapted to these things. And um, you know, to what extent that is possible is not at all understood. You know, every interesting problem away from symmetry is open. Okay, so I'll stop there.